that you were able and join with me for the call to worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your only Son to be for us both a sacrifice for sin and an example of godly living. Give us grace, thankfully, to receive his inestimable benefits and daily to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
As we come to this time of the prayer of confession, let us pause and take a moment to pray in silence, confessing our hearts before the Lord this day. Let us pray. Let us pray together. Almighty and most merciful God, you know the thoughts of our hearts. We confess that we have sinned against you and done evil in your sight. We have transgressed your holy laws. We have disregarded your word and sacraments. Forgive us, O Lord. Give us grace and power to put away all hurtful things that being delivered from the bondage of sin, we may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance, and from henceforth may ever walk in your holy ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May we hear these words of assurance of pardon found in the first chapter of First Timothy. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Thanks be to God. Amen.
the Lord calls us to draw close and examine the wounded hands and feet of Christ, the risen one, and to know the depth of his love for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of God in confidence as we pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus. Let us bow together. Lord, our Father, as Jesus entered the locked room to show his disciples the beginning of a new reality, so enter our hearts and move us to faith in Jesus as the risen one. Convince us of the reality and significance of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, be with your church throughout the world so that her preaching and works of love may continue to testify to your resurrection. Where the church is weak and faithless, build her up through your indwelling spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prince of Peace, bring peace to all parts of the earth, wherever nations are at war and people are divided. We lift the people of the Middle East, and especially the people of Israel, in the wake of yesterday's drone and missile attack by Iran. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for an end to the fighting in Ukraine and all who have suffered there. Relieve our brothers and sisters suffering for faith in you around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Wherever homes are disrupted by anger and strife, visit and bring peace and harmony. Protect those most vulnerable. Nurture and support children, youth, and the elderly at risk. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Visit and comfort those grieving the loss of loved ones and friends. Touch, heal, and strengthen the sick and infirmed. Reveal your love and power in the lives of those we silently name in our hearts before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Unite our voices with those around your throne in singing your eternal praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we present these prayers through your risen Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning before the 8.30 service, I came through the sanctuary here and took note of these beautiful cushions on the altar prayer rail. And the one on my right, the first one there, has a picture of Jesus and small children and some lambs and the inscription, let the children come to me. It's because of the high value we place on our children that we set aside this time in our service for some special moments for them and for a message for them. And following that, the opportunity for Children's Church as well. As the children are coming now, I invite the remainder of the congregation to stand and share the peace of Christ.
Well, good morning. It's a nice day today because we've had some lousy weather, haven't we? I hope you're having a good time playing today and using your outside voices. Well, today we're going to talk about liking people you don't like. Try this again. Liking people you don't like. That's tough. You're also going to hear a word, taxes. See how they're laughing? Because nobody likes taxes. Because see, what I did one time in my life, I was a tax auditor. I make sure you paid no more less. No more, no less. But you realize I had people didn't like me at all? I had people said they hated me. I was a bad person. I was a sinner. Even had one person spit on me. And I was trying to help them. I really was. Well, now we're going to talk about a tax collector in the New Testament in Luke called Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And back then, people did not like tax collectors at all because you know what happened? They take some of those taxes and put them in the back pocket. See, taxes is, let's say you have $5. Government takes one. But that $1 takes care of your police officers, takes care of your churches, I mean, your, your, your um, firemen, roads, schools, and so forth. And that's what taxes are for. So, now, back then, no one liked Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was a wee little man. I mean, wee. I'm sure, too, but, I mean, he was wee. So, one day, Jesus was going down Jericho in town, and everybody wanted to see him. Yay! But they wouldn't let Zacchaeus see him because he was so small. We don't like you, Zacchaeus. Uh-uh. Get back there. We don't want to see him. So, Zacchaeus said, I'm going to go to that sycamore tree. So, he got up ahead on that sycamore tree to see Jesus. Well, Jesus has come walking around. Hey, Zacchaeus. Hey, why don't you come down? I'm going to go into your house today and have dinner. So it went down. But you know what the people said? No, Zacchaeus is a bad person. He takes money from us. But Jesus said, no, he's come to repent. And Zacchaeus said, I want you, Lord, and I want to help you, Lord. So what he did was he gave half of all his wealth to the poor. He also said that I will give one-fourth to any person that I've hurt. So Zacchaeus was not a bad man. He really was trying to help people at the end. So again, liking people you don't like, and that's tough. Let's bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for this nice weather. Thank you for this children and the parents, and hopefully all this world that we can like people who we don't like. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. It is such a joy to welcome each one of you to worship here at Wesley, whether you're in the sanctuary or worshiping with us via the live stream. We are one church family, and it's a joy to be part of this family. I hope that everyone here in the sanctuary, uh, before you leave in a little while, you will have taken time to find those friendship folders at the end of your pew. And if you'll fill those out, give us some information about yourself, particularly those of you that are visiting with us for the first time. We really do receive you as special gifts, special guests to us from God, and we do want to get to know you. So if you'd give us some information on those friendship folders as you pass those along, we'll be very grateful. And for those of you that are visiting with us this morning uh, in the narthex, as you exit, you'll see a bunch of bags hanging on a coat tree, and those are Wesley Memorial bags, and there are gifts in those bags and information about our church, and I hope that you'll take one and uh, learn more about us as a church family. As we begin our approach now to our time of giving, we think about all the many ways that we uh, support the work of Jesus Christ here in this world, the many ways that we allow Christ to work through us here in this world. I invite you to take your bulletins, and if you will, open up to the announcements. I want to point out, there's several announcements in your bulletin. I want to point out two. If you open to the second page of the announcements, uh, you see a thank you lunch for Wesley Women. It's entitled Grateful Gathering. It's Tuesday, April the 23rd 
from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. All the women of the church are welcome. We're celebrating all the ways that uh, the women of our church volunteer and enrich our fellowship, and all the women do that in different ways. So uh, I hope you'll take time to come to this uh, celebratory luncheon. Uh, you see the menu there. You can, you can scan the QR code, or you can call the church office and make your reservation. And speaking of making reservations, right beside that announcement is the announcement about our upcoming prayer workshop. We've been doing this annually in the life of our congregation. You can do the afternoon session following lunch. You can do the evening session following dinner. And what we do in this prayer workshop annually is after you've had your meal, in the course of two hours, you'll, rota you'll rotate through three quick classes on ways to more immerse your life in prayer. Uh, classes that will help you with practices so that you can become a more prayerful person. Uh, classes that will help you practice the presence of God in your life. But because meals are involved before the afternoon uh, session or before the evening session, you choose the one that works best for you. Uh, if you would call the church office and let us know that you're coming, that will make sure that we have plenty of meals available. I'm going to invite Kyle Brown on behalf of the Staff Parish Relations Committee to come and join us at the lectern. And he's got a, a word of gratitude that he would like to share with us this morning. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good morning, my name is Kyle Brown and I serve on your Staff Parish Relations Committee. As we all know, the past several months have been unusually challenging for our chancel choir. With the sudden and tragic loss of Frank Feferetti, our choir was leaderless as Frank was both director and organist. Of course, our choir persevered in the face of this great loss. This morning, I'd like for you to join me in recognizing the hard work of four individuals in our choir who took on tremendous extra duties, keeping our choir on track and true to their calling of leading our worship from Advent and Christmas all the way through Easter. <clears throat> Diana and Bob Carter, Lindsay Odom and Philip Leach each used their strengths and talents to support our choir when we needed them most selecting the call to worship, anthem, choral benediction for each Sunday, and leading the choir through rehearsals, all while, all while offering constant encouragement and supportive feedback. As a result of their efforts, the congregation likely saw no change in the type or quality of music the choir provided. Choir members continued to be challenged and motivated by their excellent leadership. Our choir membership actually increased and attendance did not suffer. Uh, Diane, I don't believe, is with us today, but Bob, uh, Lindsay, and Philip, uh, please stand and let the congregation uh, express our sincere thanks and gratitude for all you have done. Thank you. We are so blessed here at Wesley Memorial Church, and th those four people that were just mentioned are part of the great blessings that we've received here. So, Pastor Ken, come and tell us some more ways we're changing the world. Last week, we were surprised in many different ways. One is we did not have the typical Sunday after Easter worship attendance. We had so many more people than we expected, and that translated to many more volunteers helping to pack the homeless care kits. We had 10 tables, assembly stations set up, uh, anticipating about 120 folks to help. We needed six more tables to accommodate about 60 or 70 additional volunteers. What beautiful chaos it was. Watching seasoned citizens like me, families with young children, all joining together, circling those tables, putting together the care kits. 
you assembled over a thousand care kits in under 40 minutes, which is phenomenal. Now, I've been telling you about some of the things in these care kits, but there's something that I want you to know specifically. Each care kit has three pieces of information. The first is an encouraging note. This care kit has been prepared and shared with you by the Wesley Memorial Church family. We hope it is helpful to you. Please contact the organizations listed in the enclosed brochure to get additional help. We partner with these organizations to serve and care for you and your needs. We recognize this is a difficult time for you. And we believe life can get better as you take intentional steps with the help of these caring ministry partners. May the presence and love of Christ be with you and hold you close with loving kindness, the Wesley Memorial family. In addition to that note is a listing of our deep level partners in the community that work specifically with the homeless population with contact information and the services they provide. And one additional thing is the Gospel of John in a modern language translation. Now, Jeff talked about the bags that are hanging out there for our guests with the gifts within them. These bags are on tables as you go out toward the double doors in the front of the sanctuary. We're asking you, please, go by, get one for every vehicle you drive, Put it in there, and I trust that God is going to bring you the opportunity to share one of these with a person who will be blessed by it. Now, it's okay if you come back and get more. We packed over a 1,000. We want them all to find their way into the hands of someone God wants to bless through Wesley Memorial. And this was an example of over and above giving. You know that uh, because of your generosity in the Easter offering, $17,343 was made available for the care kits. To have a complete change of bedding at the women's shelter called Leslie's House, all new mattresses, all new linens and covers for these women who are going through a very difficult experience, many of them fleeing domestic abuse situations you are touching them in profound ways. Open Door Ministries and the Men's Shelter there, Partners Ending Homelessness. This was over and above what you do every week as the ushers come to receive an offering or you send in your tithes and offerings to the church office as a matter of our faithful stewardship. Thank you for your generous and caring hearts. We are Wesley and that means we are a Christ-centered, serving, growing, giving community. Amen? Amen. As the ushers come.
them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I? With deep and abiding gratitude for what has been, and in the greatest of hope for what yet will be because of your grace and power, active and operational in your church, we give you thanks, O God. Amen.
As you're being seated, I invite you to find a Bible, if you will, and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 3. As I said last week, it is traditional in the life of the church post-Easter to look at the earliest Christian community. The earliest Christian community there within months or years of the resurrection of Jesus, now that the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, and then the return of Jesus through the power of His Spirit at Pentecost has occurred, the Christian community must ask itself, now what? What do we do as the Christian community? What are we called to be about as the Christian community? And we see how they answered the question in the book of Acts. Last week, we used a text from the book of Acts, and we saw that the early Christian community was a community of great grace and great power and great generosity. We're going to look at another text this morning, and we're going to learn yet more about this earliest Christian community. So we'll pick up with some of the apostles here in chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading at verse 11. Peter and John have just brought healing to a man that was born lame. And after that man is healed, we pick up with the text, verse 11, chapter 3, Acts. While he, the one that was healed, clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy One, the Holy and Righteous One, and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Then Peter continues, And now, friends, I, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Would you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts together here and now in this place, at this time, be acceptable to you, for you and you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you want to understand a text in the Bible, you have to understand the context of that text. This is a sermon that you heard a few moments ago, a sermon summary that Peter preached, but you need to know what happened before Peter preached that sermon. You notice, if you begin reading early in chapter 3, that Peter and John, they're there in Jerusalem, they go up to the temple for a set time of prayer. The early apostles, the early Christians are still centered in the city of Jerusalem. 
That is our spiritual homeland. That is where we began and from whence we came, the city of Jerusalem. It's always, I thought, been rather ironic that Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, literally means in the Hebrew, a city of shalom, a city of peace. But it's rarely been that in its 3,000-year history. Last week, you heard Priscilla Smith sing the Holy City. That was my request. I wanted to hear the Holy City. It's a song that's meant a lot to me over the years. We use it sometimes when we go to Jerusalem. I take groups to Jerusalem, and I love that song for so many reasons. But it, it reminds me that the city of Jerusalem, the historical, physical city of Jerusalem, one day will become part of the new Jerusalem. And then, and perhaps only then, Yerushalayim, the city of peace, will finally, finally live up to its name. Jerusalem is very important to the Christian faith. Uh, I am sure that many of you, perhaps without even knowing it, you have been obeying the command of Psalm 122.6. You've been praying for the peace of Jerusalem. I hope you've been praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And it is sad to see what has happened in the last 24 hours. You know my love for Jerusalem. For 20 years, Tammy and I have been taking groups over there. We actually were scheduled to be there this week. But of course, earlier in the year, we postponed to next year. I love the land of our birth. I love the people of that region. They're beautiful people. It's a beautiful land. And it breaks my heart when there's suffering there. Probably my closest friend over there is the, the, the person, David, who has been my tour guide for 20 years. This next trip will be the 10th time he has led us. As the bombing was beginning yesterday, he just texted me. He texted me the words of Psalm 17:8 which say, keep me as the apple of your eye, hold me in the shadow of your wings. I'm sure there are a lot of people um, in the last hours who have been praying that in the land of Israel. We catch up with the apostles here in the book of Acts. They are in Israel. We are here within about three months of the resurrection of Jesus. They are still hanging out there. And as Peter and John go to the temple in Israel, they go through the beautiful gate. And as they go through the beautiful gate, they see a man that is carried there every day, a man that, who has been lame from birth. And he goes there to beg alms from the people as they come to the temple for sacrifice. And this man sees Peter and John. Peter and John sees this man. Their eyes connect, and the text tells us that this man knew he was going to receive something from Peter and John. He received more than he probably hoped to receive from Peter and John. I love the way Peter is quoted in the King James. In King James, Peter beautifully says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And you know he did. Not only did he rise up and walk, it says that he jumped and he leapt and he praised God. I'm sure it created quite a commotion there in the Temple Mount. That's the court of the Gentiles. So there could have been as many as 10,000 people there. This was a set prayer time during the day, 3 p.m. The, the Temple Mount would have been filled, so there's a commotion over there. And the text says that the people started staring at Peter and John. You know, six years ago, I told you what my pet peeve was, and it's probably time for me to tell you again what my pet peeve is. Then I'm going to tell you my second pet peeve. My pet peeve for the people in this culture that don't know how to use a turn signal. I mean, it really, really, really bothers me. You know, maybe they don't know where they're going in life, but I wish they'd at least let me know a hint of which way they're going. That's my pet peeve, people who just refuse to use a turn signal. And by the way, if you're halfway into the turn, it doesn't count. Another one of my pet peeves are people who stare. 
I was at a restaurant recently, and I was waiting on a friend of mine to pay the bill. He was graciously paying the bill. I'm standing there. And you know how you can sort of sense that someone's staring at you? Well, this person was overtly staring at me. And I run into a lot of people that I know, but just say something to me. Don't just stare. And she stared, and she stared. I finally walked across the lobby and said, do I know you? And I, and, and I did, so I appreciate the conversation, but I, if I hadn't been sort of slightly, slightly um, irritated by the staring, I probably wouldn't have even walked across and asked who she was. These people are here in the court, and it may be thousands of them, they're staring at Peter and John. And Peter preaches. Tell you two things quickly about this sermon. You probably noticed that he begins by talking about Jesus. I wish more Christian preachers throughout history would pay attention to all of these sermons we find in the book of Acts. They are models for Christian preaching. And Christian preaching should be about Jesus. Listen to Peter. He says, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? I think they were irritated too. And why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors. He wants to make sure that crowd knows that he's a devout Jew. The God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus. See how quickly he gets to Jesus? Notice the titles used for Jesus by Peter. He first says, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. That was Barabbas. Asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed. Look at the irony here. You killed, Peter says to them, you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, was the agent of God's creation. We learn in the Bible. He is the author of life. And this is the one whom God raised from the dead. And then Peter says, as he and John are standing there together, to this we are witnesses. That's what we're called to do. Bear witness to Jesus Christ. That's why we put a gospel of John in these homeless care kits that we gave away. We're always to be bearing witness to our faith in Jesus Christ. We do what we do because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We're called to just witness to Him, witness to what He has done in our lives. That's our calling. So Peter says, we are witnesses and by faith in His name, His name itself has made this man strong whom you see and know in the faith that is through Jesus has given him perfect health in the presence of all of you. So he begins by preaching Jesus. We do seek fervently here at Wesley Memorial to be a Christ-centered church. You can focus on so many things in life, but we're called. We know that it's our calling. It's the historic calling of the Christian community to be a Christ-centered church. It was the great author Flannery O'Connor, who was a Southern author, an amazing author, one of my favorites. She wrote in the 1950s. She died in the 1960s. She lived in Milledgeville, Georgia, wrote amazing novels, amazing short stories. And someone asked her one day, why does it seem that Southern authors seem to be so prolific? Well, Flannery said, there, there are a few reasons. One, we're good storytellers by nature down south. And she also said another reason is we just have a large number of unique characters down south that give us you know, fertile territory for our stories. And then she went on, and this was the 1950s, she then went on to say the South, though not Christ-centered any longer, is Christ-haunted. That has always haunted me. 
There's a difference between being Christ-centered and Christ-haunted. There are a lot of people in our culture that have a memory of the Christian faith. There's something that tells them at Christmas and at Easter they should go to church. They can hum along with the Christmas carols in the, in the stores at Christmas time. But they're just Christ-haunted. There's a memory there that comes and goes. That's different from being Christ-centered. We seek to be Christ-centered. That's what Peter is preaching here. And then, beginning at verse 17, Peter offers a challenge, a call to the crowd. He says, and now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. You see, even though all of them were not there when they shouted, crucify him, they all were responsible for the world they had created We bear responsibility not just for our personal sins, but we do bear responsibility for the culture we create. So Peter says, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. And then he says, repent. That's the message of the Christian community. Repent, therefore, and that means turn to God. And then you see what comes from turning to God. Your sins may be wiped out. The word wiped out there in the Greek can be obliterated. That's the forgiveness that's offered to us in Jesus Christ. And then he mentions two more gifts that are offered to people who come to Christ seeking forgiveness of their sins. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So that times of refreshing may come. We turn to Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. We're birthed into the new community. We can experience times of refreshing, the work of the Holy Spirit, the reviving, the renewing, the refreshing spirit of Jesus Christ can be made real in our lives, and that's how we find fullness of life in Jesus Christ. So we get forgiveness. We get times of refreshing And then there's a third thing he says after he mentions the times of refreshing that may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration. Those are important terms in the New Testament, universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Come to Christ, he'll forgive you your sins, he will give you new life that feels like seasons of refreshing. And then we wait until he returns again and the universal restoration will happen. Creation will become what it was originally intended to be. The kingdom of God will come here on this earth just as it's being fulfilled right now in heaven universal restoration and when you're with a group of Jews as Peter was here in the temple in Jerusalem and you mention restoration they also take that to mean a restoration of the people of Israel there will come a time when the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem will be central to the kingdom of God so that's the call my friends are you Christ centered or are you only Christ haunted Have you been impacted by the work of Christ so that now you know what it is we're to be about? We are all being formed by something or somebody here in this world. Recommend a book to you in closing because we need to be careful who it is that's forming us. If you've not read the New York Times bestseller, The Shallows, I invite you to read it, The Shallows by Nicholas Carr. That title may not mean much to you. Let me give you the subtitle. What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. That's the subtitle, The Shallows. He, he wrote, in, it came out in 2015, it's been just reissued with, with additional material. He wrote as he examined the impact of social media and smartphones on our brains. He begins the book by saying, over the last few years, I've had an uncomfortable sense that someone or something has been tinkering with my brain. My mind isn't going so far as I can tell, but it's changing. I'm not thinking the way I used to think. I feel it most strongly when I'm reading. I used to find it easy, he wrote, to immerse myself in a book or a lengthy article. 
my mind would get caught up in the twist of the narratives or the turns of the argument, and I'd spend hours strolling through long stretches of prose. That's rarely the case anymore. Now my concentration starts to drift after a page or two. I get fidgety, lose the thread, begin looking for something else to do. I feel like I'm always dragging my brain back to the text. The deep reading that used to come naturally has become a struggle. We are all being formed by someone or something. The culture around us is trying to form us. We have to consciously, using all the grace that God gives us, seek to be a Christ-centered human being and a Christ-centered church. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll finish, complete this message in each one of our lives. May your Spirit help us to answer the question, who or what is at the center of our life? We pray, God, that you will complete this message and do whatever work you seek to do in us. Help us to receive you, help us to enthrone you, and help us to live lives centered on you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand as you are able. Let us turn and face the cross and affirm what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.